I lost it. Where is it at? Let's go back. Not that, not that, not that. That. All right. Good morning, guys. <clears throat> um, since we're talking about, you know, phasing sticks and um, high pot and all, uh, actually, I'm going to show you another video here. I'm going to share my screen, and it is a different kind of phasing sticks or high pot sticks that Duke started buying a couple years ago, a little bit different um, from the ones that you've seen on the other video that Professor Shoemaker has shown you. So I'm gonna share my screen here. And share. And let's look at this right here. Can everybody see my screen? I can see, yeah. There he is. Yep. Okay. Hello, my name is Joe Beer, and I'm with Beer and Associates. And today we're going to demonstrate high potting with our P25 all purpose utility phasing meter. Before we begin high potting, we first want to test the meter to make sure it functions properly. The first test is performed by turning the selector switch to the test switch position. This test checks approximately 90% of the circuitry within the PD25. You'll notice that the test position is a momentary position, so you must hold it there in order for it to display the battery voltage. This meter has 8.6 volts. The next test is what's considered a known voltage test. Since we know this three-phase pad mount is energized and we touch the X2 and X3 bushing, we should get close to 208 volts. You can see from the meter display, we get 212 volts. So now we know this meter, the second probe, and the interconnect cable are all good. This is what we consider a 100% test. Since the PD25 is an extremely accurate QRMS phasing meter, we can actually use it to test the high pot adapter. Here we have it attached to the meter probe, and we want to read approximately 70% of the voltage line to ground. The meter is displaying a little over 70 volts, so now we know the high pot adapter is good as well. We can begin high potting. All of our high potting demonstration will take place in our training yard between two three phase pad mounts. After testing the meter and high pot, we need to make sure we put the meter in the correct switch position. Since this is a 13.8 kV phase to ground pad mount transformer, the meter is put in a 20 kV switch position. With the primary de-energized cable to be tested, isolated and parked on the far end, isolated and parked on a feed-through bushing on the near end, insert the probe without the high pot into the feed-through bushing. It is important to remember the probe without the high pot is connected to the de-energized cable, while the probe with the high pot is always connected to the energized source. Note the reading on the meter once the cable has had time to charge to the potential applied to it. The meter is displaying approximately 100 volts. This means the cable being tested has approximately two microamps of leakage. This would be considered a very good cable. If the reading on the meter were to stay high, this would indicate that the cable has a direct ground and the reading would somewhat duplicate what we saw whenever we tested the high pot. If the reading on the meter were to oscillate between a high and a low reading, this would indicate that the cable actually is incurring a flashover every time it is charged. This would also be considered a bad cable. If your utility would like to develop a pass-fail criteria, it's important to remember that on a PD-25, Every 100 volts is equal to two microamps of leakage. That way, if a reading is higher, you can actually determine how much leakage a cable has. Since this cable was good and able to accept the full potential charge, we now need to discharge it. Again, remember we need to use the probe with the high pot connected to source, which is the energized cable. Take the second probe and touch it to ground. Notice the reading on the meter. It will spike high and then go to zero. 
Now the cable is safe to handle. Thank you for watching our high flying demonstration using our PD25 all purpose utility phasing meter. Okay, guys, that, that's very, that's basically the same thing, but just a different piece of equipment that they're using here. Um, I actually got to go to that factory where they build this stuff and watched um, a demonstration on another piece of, a different piece of equipment. And uh, that's been several years ago, but they, they build all kind of, they have all kind of new technology in there where it's, um, they got some guys from engineering, some some ex-linemen, um, all kind of folks in there throughout the industry that are putting this stuff together. And it's uh, it's not cheap stuff, you know, it, it, it looks small, looks cheap, but it's not. It's, you know, that piece of equipment's a, a few thousand dollars. And um, of course, really Duke spares no expense on um, on their, on that kind of equipment. So, but uh, very good piece of equipment. Uh, I've only seen it used one time, but, um, Good stuff there, Professor Shoemaker. Uh, could you uh, just keep rewinding? Well, go ahead and go out all the way, all the way to the beginning. I'll just tell you when to pause it. You want me to play it? Yeah, go ahead. Now we're going to demonstrate hot potting with our P25 all purpose utility phasing meter. Before we begin hot potting, we first want to test the meter to make sure it's functioning properly. The first test is performed by turning the selector switch to the test switch position. This test checks approximately 90% of the circuitry within the PD25. You'll notice that the test switch position is a momentary position, so you must hold it there in order for it to display the battery voltage. This meter has 8.6 volts. The next was considered a known voltage test. Since we know this three-phase pad mount is energized and we touch the X2 and X3 bushing, we should get close to 208 volts. You can pause it there. Okay, uh, I've never done this before. So typically uh, when, you, when you go out there, get your information, either you're gonna know your system when you start working on it. And he eventually gets to the process where he says it's a 13.8 kV circuit. Just remember there when you put the high pot on and you start doing high potting, which he is not yet, he's just checking the sticks for voltage, is that the high potting process is going to be approximately 70% of your phase to ground voltage. So he, he kind of, I don't, don't wanna say misled you, he gave you the phase, phase to phase voltage. And you'll hear it in just a minute, 13.8 but you're going to be using the sticks in the process of a phase to ground voltage on primary, which 13,800, I don't have a calculator with me, divided by 1.7325 mm -hmm. should be right around what, a 70, 7,400 volt primary system phase to ground. So do keep that in mind when you start using the sticks. And that, that's typically the test that we did. We didn't test it on secondary. We just went ahead and applied it to primary. And if we were, we were working with a 7,200 volt primary system and we got 70% of that, then we, then we knew that stick tested correctly. Okay, has anybody got any idea what the output voltage of this transformer is rated at? He's reading 212 on the meter. Anybody? No. Okay, there's, we've made some three-phase max before, and this is a three-phase transformer. And you remember, most of the voltage were, was either 120, 240, 120, 208, and uh, 277, 480. Uh, what do you think is the closest voltage here? 208. 208. Why is it reading 212? The plus or minus 5%. It's within the plus or five minus 5%. Five Thank you very much for giving that answer. But you'll notice there's nothing connected to it. There's no secondary cables connected to it. And transformers, uh, I don't want to say instinctively, 
are built in the process that they're gonna run a little bit high on their output voltage when nothing is connected to it. And it's gonna be within the plus or five minus 5%. So he's four volts above 208, but there's no amperage or voltage draw off of it. So that's why it reads a little bit high in that meter. I just wanted to give that explanation for you right there. When you hook up a brand new 120, 240 single phase transformer, you're probably gonna get 122, 123. Uh, but when you start applying electrical services to it and people start consuming off of it, it does come back down to the mid-range voltage around, you know, 119, 120. So I just want to give that information. Carry on there, Professor V. Okay. On the feed of display, we get 212 volts. So now we know this meter, the second probe, and the interconnect cable are all good. This is what we consider a 100 percent test. Since the PD25 is an extremely accurate QRMS phasing meter, we can actually use it to test the high pot adapter. Here we have it attached to the meter probe and we want to read approximately 70% of the voltage line to ground. The meter is displaying a little over 70 volts, so now we know the high pot adapter is good as well. We can begin demonstration will take place in our between two three phase pad mount. After testing the meter and high Okay, pot, you can pause it right there. Well, back it up a little bit so it shows the full. He's out of his way. There you go. All right, just, uh, just pause. Okay. Just to give you some information here, gentlemen, and uh, it can get more congested than this in some instances. Uh, you're working, understood, this is what they call a dead front transformer. That's because all of these elbow attachments that you see both on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, they are insulated. But once you start moving elbows around, remember that white tip that we saw inside the elbow is not to be considered insulated. It's just a guide. So, uh, Professor V? Yeah using your mouse, if you could explain, you see how those ground leads are coming off the dummy receptacles? Right here. And how these elbows are so close to it. Could you give some explanation there of the potential for flashover? Yeah, you want to be real careful. You see how these these uh, little ground wires are hanging down. They're, they're actually flopped down over this elbow here. Uh, what, perfect, what we like to do is when we install this stuff, we kind of like to go behind these elbows where it's not really draped down across it. Or um, if we have to move this elbow out, we want to have somebody else with a shotgun stick or either pull this out of the way, depending on where it's going to go. We want to make sure these are clear of the elbows because like you said, those, the little white tips are, you know, you could get that into the primary two and cause a big flash or get it into those grounds and cause a big flash, but you want to keep them out of the way. Um, and these actually bleed off static off of the um, dead end receptacle here if it's not on. I, when, when I first went to work with the utilities, we actually had to go up to Camden outside of Lugolf, that area, and actually install these little wires back into the back side of the um right here where the elbows are they have them here on the elbows because the contractors went up there and put these transformers in and they did not connect this up and you could really hear it buzzing pretty loud so we had to go in there and, and ground these um static points on these elbows so but yeah you want to make sure they're out of the way just like this one goes behind but you still want to be careful when you take moving these elbows around because i mean you can have a pretty substantial flash uh, if you come in contact with them with the elbow. Yeah, if when you get in, in a situation like this, when you're starting to move energized elbows and move energized things in such a confined little space right here, get assistance. Yeah. Uh, you no, know, and I'll, I'll pose this question out to you before and it's kind of, <clears throat> kind of a head scratcher. On overhead, when you get guys get ready to go work on overhead lines, what voltage can you work? First starting out, you're only allowed to work on de-energized, right? Right, that is correct. You're, it's going to be typically some companies say one year. 
uh, some other companies say when they feel confident and uh, that you're competent to go ahead and work on it. So you're just going to have to, you know, go through those processes. How about underground? When are you guys going to be able to work anything energized underground? I'd reckon the same amount of time. Surprisingly, uh, you can start working energized underground right away because everything is done with a stick. Mm -hmm. Overhead, you're going to be hands on. Uh, underground, all movement of conductors and uh, working with things inside transformers and pad mounted equipment, your switch gears and your three phase enclosures is done with a stick. So now you have uh, whatever length of stick KV insulation. Uh, again, you're going to have some companies say no, but once a stick is introduced, and we'll go back to the overhead here in just a moment, once a stick's introduced, you're able to go ahead and work it. You're not working hands-on. So you get into a situation that somebody asks you to do some elbow movement in here and some of them are energized or whatnot, ask for assistance. Uh, I've seen plenty of linemen that are you know, moving elbows and it'll do just exactly what Professor Vermelin said. Uh, could you hold that wire out of the way? Right. Or, you know, could you could you get this thing cleared up before I pull the elbow off? So just be safe. This is this is tight. Yeah. The, the other part of it, too, and not to say that I would want it to ever happen. A fault occurs in this spot right here, gentlemen. It's focused towards you. What do I mean by that? That's the only way it can go. Is out. Yeah. The only way it can go is straight towards you in the air up in a bucket truck. Uh God forbid it ever happens in the air. That's going to go in a 360 degree and it's going to disperse out. And hopefully you're not near it at all. In a pad mount transformer, you're sitting here with an eight or 10 foot stick. And that blast is going to be focused right back at you to where you're standing at. So be safe. Uh, Professor V, as far as that's concerned, I think you, you can carry on here. You good? Yeah. Oh. I'm, a, I'm good with it if you got yeah, it. I'm good. I'm good. I just want to get those points in right there. That That's a right. tight spot in there. Tight spot. All right. Yep. To work on. It is. I'm going to stop share. Okay. All right. So uh, Professor V and I both, want, we took a review of and understood that the uh, test that was assigned yesterday is not due until uh, tonight at midnight. We did get some uh, results back, and I, I won't call names. Hold on one second. You cannot minimize while you're in a meeting. Great. And uh, hold on. Quiz is quiz two. Great. No names involved here, but I'm um, looking at 64s, 52s, 64s, 48s. Uh, one person got an 84, so that looks disturbingly bad. Uh, Professor V, how's it look on your side? Yeah, same. Uh, I'm going into it now. Um, I had uh, two actually make 100. Okay. And then the rest of them are just like yours. They go from 52 to 60, 56, 72, 48, 92, 84. So uh, 48 is the lowest. Um, guys, I, I, I had communications with, you know, one of the guys yesterday and had to just, uh, you know, reiterate, they, you know, he was saying that, you know, they were bombing it and it was tough and all, but if you'd go back to the video, and watch the video that covers all this, you know, that's where the material's at. So, I mean, I know it's it's right because two of you got a hundred on it. So, um, you know, it is what it is. So, Professor V and I have not discussed, and I have not discussed this this morning. What do you want to do, V? Uh, do we want to review over it and get another shot at it or? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking here. We'll just review it again and, uh, give another attempt to everybody. Of course, those people that got 100, you got 100, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, and we have the capability here to go ahead, there's Caleb Cook again, in the grading process, and I'll just give an example here. Uh, the person that got the 52, if you get 100, 152 divided by two is what? Mm. 70, 76. 
76. So you'll end up with the 76. That's the way, that's the route that we will take. Uh, the gray book will let us do that. So I think that's what we'll do. We'll just go and throw in another attempt for those people that are here in the room. You can take, you should be able to see your grade now. Uh, you can have another attempt at it and those two scores will be averaged. For those that got a hundred, you don't need to do it again. That's your average and you're going to be going backwards if you get one wrong just by accident. Right. Okay, so let's go ahead while we got the chance here and just give a review. Okay. And uh, I'll go over the questions. So, and I'm not gonna give this person's name out or what, I'm just going through the questions here. What equipment is used to locate underground secondary cable? Dynatel. Dynatel, okay. Uh, which one of the listed methods below is not used to introduce a signal onto the secondary cable using the Dynatel. The first choice is direct connect. We know that works. Dynacoupler, that works. Radar, no. and induction. Radar. radar. Radar, radar, right. Radar is the primary. Uh, and we're using a dyna Dynatel here, that's secondary. What frequency is used with, located, with the locating wand when not using the transmitter? 60 hertz. 60 hertz, that's correct. 60 hertz is emitted by the cable inherently. Electricity is produced at 60 hertz in the United States. When locating cable, the ground probe is placed, and this is true or false, 90 degrees out from the suspect cable path. Right. True, I've got a lot of people that got that wrong. And man, how many times did I say that? Yeah. 90 degrees, gentlemen. Locating. When locating a secondary fault, what additional item is used? So hold on one second before you answer. When we're locating, we can either use the wand or the wand and the transmitter. When we're going to secondary fault, we got to add one piece of additional equipment. And what would that be? The A frame. A frame, correct. Where does the ground probe go when locating faults? Well, if we knew it went 90 degrees when we're lo locating uh, secondary lines, now that we're going to locate faults, where does it go? Behind it. You're right. In line and behind the cable path. That was in the video multiple times. What is the best frequency selection to use when locating cable with a transmitter and one for electric cable? Oh. Yeah, all, this person got it incorrect. Name two methods to determine a faulted span of primary cable. We uh, discussed this yesterday a couple of times. What two methods can we find out if the span is faulted? Not finding the fault, just finding out if it has a fault in it. High potting and... What turns red and white? Indicators. Right. right. Indicators. You can high pot the cable, that'll tell you if it's bad, or look at your fault indicators between the red and white. What trips a fault indicator? Magnetic field. Okay. Uh, I'm head scratching here. A fault indicator, gentlemen, goes on primary. Uh, this answer here says an underground secondary fault. It was the answer, so I don't know. A fault occurs on a conductor, a magnetic field is produced. That's what trips the indicator. Huh. When using fault indicators, how do you determine which span of primary is faulted? One, blown fuse. Two, use the thump mode. Three, use the radar mode. Or, and this is using fault indicators, follow the red indicators until white. Am I still in class? Yep. Can you repeat it one more time? When using fault indicators, please. how do you determine which span of primary is faulted? Blown fuse. Use the thump mode. Use the radar mode. Follow the red indicators until white. Follow the red indicators until white. That is correct. 
Okay, fault indicators have a red and white window in them. You gotta follow them until a red and turns into white. The fault isn't in that span. Using the HiPod adapter, what fault condition exists if the test reading of the primary starts at 3.5 and stays at 3.5? Punctured fault, good cable, or bolted fault? Bolted. Bolted. Bolted, bolted fault. Paul, I got a question for you. You weren't here when we uh, did this originally, right? How do you, how do you know this? I, I did the bolted one because I got notes. It's the red and white. In the fault indicator thing, I am doing nothing about. <laughs> okay, so how are you answering the fault indicator ones? Because I was like researching and watching the video. No, it ta da! Bing, bing, bing! Ding, ding, ding! Watching the video. I got a few notes on that, on the bolted one, but I, I know I missed a few things. I definitely mm -hmm. missed a few things. But you bounced back and you researched and watched the video. Yeah, I did, watched a few videos. Okay, when the high pod adapter. Using the HiPod adapter, what fault condition exists if the stick test reading of primary starts at 3.5, goes to zero, stays at zero? One, bolted fault. Two, good cable. Three, punctured fault. Good cable. Good cable. Good cable. Thank you very much. Using the HiPod adapter, what fault condition exists if the stick test reading of primary starts at 3.5, lowers to 1.1 and goes back to 3.5. Choices, punctured fault, bolted fault, good cable. Punctured. punctured fault, thank you. After testing a span of primary cable for five minutes, and this is going by the video, you should bleed off the voltage of the cable for five minutes, one minute, 25 minutes, 15 minutes. 15. Five Fif minutes. 15. The guy in the video said three times the amount of time that you test the cable. So if you go out there and test the cable for seven minutes, how long are you supposed to ground it? 21. 21. There you go. Three times the cable. Testing time. What piece of equipment is used to locate primary faults in the ground? Primary faults. Von. Von Arc reflection system. Okay. Okay. Uh, this person has a Dynatel, that's secondary faults. The modes for primary locating machine are radar and thump, true or false? True. True. What must be done with the ground wire from the primary fault locating machine when testing? Rolled up tightly, shorted out, unrolled completely. Unrolled completely. There you go. What type of connection must be used when locating primary and secondary faults? False now. Radar, thump, direct connect, or tested? Direct connect. Direct connect is used in both primary and secondary fault locating, and it must be used. There's no other method. In South Carolina, you must call true or false 811 before any digging is done. True. True. What is the primary standoff bushing used for? To ground the cable? to energize the cable, to isolate the cable. Isolate. 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 Standoff is a dead end, correct. What is the primary feed through bushing used for? Now there was two purposes they used it in the video. I'll give you to energize the primary cable, to isolate the primary cable, to ground and feed through the primary cable. Ground and feed through. Ground and feed through. You can ground the cable in a feed through, and you can feed through the primary cable on a feed through. The answer to the question, primary feed through bushing, is in the answer, feed through. In a single phase pad mount transformer, the H1B is in boy bushing is used for the incoming primary cable, true or false? False. False, H1A, and that's on the left-hand side is used. 23, when locating secondary faults, the A-frame should always lead with which color or it will not locate the fault correctly. Green, red, either red or green will work. Either red or green will work. Either red or green will work, just as long as you follow the direction of the frame. In a three-phase transformer, 
which primary bushing is directly related to the secondary bushings, X1, X2, X3? Answers, HA, HB, HC, H1, H2, H3, XYZ. H1, H2, H3. Right, X1, directly related to H1, X2, directly related to H2, X3, directly related to H3. In a three-phase enclosure, the inbound primary cable is located on the first position, left to right of each module, true or false? True. Right. Any inbound primary or secondary feed that we're putting in a water connect, connect, watertight connector is placed in the number one position left-hand side. That is all. Any questions? Mr. Shoemaker? Yep. Will you be posting this video today? I post all the videos every day. Wait, just want to make sure. Thank you. Okay. All right, with that, let's go ahead and take, it's about 9.36. Let's be back at about 9.46. Let's take a little break here. Uh, when will that uh, second attempt be available? This afternoon. Damn for. Okay, gentlemen, it's 946, so we are back. And I had a couple of requests here to go through another presentation. So if you want to review this presentation. And uh, Professor V, are you there? I'm here. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we were we put in that Dropbox that you were able to sit to uh, put in multiple submissions, correct? Correct. All right. So gentlemen, if you've got if you review this video and you've already made a submission in there and you're not pleased with the submission you made, you can make a new one and the old one gets dropped. So I uh, just want to give you a heads up on that. So I will go through this uh, presentation that was done before by a student to give you the information that you need for yours. Not to say that it's going to be 100% correct, but I will correct any errors or problems that I see on the video. And you'll notice here, he's using, he's using the same method that I was telling you about. He's got the uh, pictures up from the underground training yard that we have out in the field. So the first one he's got here is a dip pole. A three phase, three primary phases go through switches and down through a duct. Uh, it's okay to call it duct. Uh, most people call it conduit, but that's okay. To the underground systems below. Dip poles run overhead primary to underground. So it's a transition. I'm overhead and I transition to underground. The pole to the left has three primary phases running through a duct to underground. Riser poles serve the opposite function and are used when underground lines come back to back to overhead. And he's just doubles, doubled his words here. So dip poles, the feed direction is from overhead to underground. Riser poles, the feed direction is from underground back out to overhead. And we've discussed this before. Uh, this has got to be an exclusive dip pole because it is fused right here. A riser pole either has to be directly connected to the primary, the underground has to be directly connected to it, or you have to have what they call a dead blade switch. And that's the pole that I showed you guys out the field on the other side of the field that's actually in use. Any questions? Next slide. Switch gear. This is a switch gear. It is designed to meet switching and isolation requirements of the distribution system. This is a four by two by two box, four compartments in total, two on each side. Sorry about that. Red, white, and blue designate which phase is going where. Also note how the numbers are mirrored and correspond. Now, a little, probably a little bit more information here on this four by two by two. How many compartments are there in total? Four. 
how many are switching compartments? Two. 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 And how many are fused compartments? Two. Two. So the purpose of a switch gear is to switch feeders and provide taps. Is to switch feeders, that's on the uh, opposite side, and provide taps. You can actually see me in that picture. How about that? <clears throat> three phase junction enclosure. You can call it a three phase junction or a three phase enclosure or, or both. The three phase junction enclosure sends primary power to designated transformers. Each phase is color coded red, white, and blue. Left side bushing is inbound and right side bushing is outbound. Elbows can be moved to isolate faults and reconfigured in coordination with transformers to restore power. Sorry about that. I was trying to scroll down here at the bottom. Uh, does that sound like a good explanation to you guys? Does everybody does agree? Sound, does it sound like a good explanation to you? Uh, no, I know. I think so. You can't answer a question with a question. I think it explains it pretty good. I think it does do it. It does a, a, a good, decent job for it. Uh, just to remember that I'm able to come inbound, which I do on my left hand side. I would probably put a little bit more emphasis that they have four way modules in here. So inbound with one, outbound on three. And this also, even though it is in the yard in this configuration that we see, see here, the three phase junction enclosure sends primary power to designated transformers. Can I go from a three phase tr uh, enclosure to another three phase enclosure? Yes. Yeah. Sure, why not? Can I go from a three phase enclosure to a single phase enclosure? <coughs> mm. With one phase? Yeah. Yep. So don't limit yourself on this first paragraph here and uh, say that it has to go exclusively to designated transformers. I would probably just say here, the three phase junction enclosure sends primary out to other equipment. Okay, and that leaves that scope fully open. It sends it out to other underground equipment. Okay. Three phase pad mount transformer. A pad mounted transformer serves the same function as a pole mounted transformer. It steps down voltage to deliver to the customer, but it's designed a little differently. Left compartment is for primary side. Right compartment is for secondary side. The H1, H2, and H3 have a left and right bushing. So he's saying H1, H2, H3, left incoming, right outbound. Good explanation going on right there. When he says designed a little bit differently, if you want to put here, this is definitely different than the overhead one, it's a three-phase self-contained transformer. What do I mean by self-contained? Do I have transformers in the back of it? Right. Do I have three pad mounted transformers sitting here, or do I have one with all three transformers self-contained? One with all three. That, that's what self-contained means. All three transformers are in one box. That's self-contained. Single phase enclosure. Works like a three phase enclosure, but for a single phase. Goes to a single, trans, single phase transformer. Don't limit yourself here. It's just like the one we just spoke about a minute ago. I can go from a single phase enclosure to another single phase enclosure. I can go from a single phase enclosure actually back to a three phase enclosure if I want to join there, or I can go to a single phase transformer. So just use this as a junction to single phase equipment or three phase enclosures. Don't limit yourself. He's limiting himself to a single phase transformer right there with that quote. Single phase pad mount transformer. A single phase pad mount transformer is similar to a three phase transform, but for a single phase for customers with single phase equipment. Makes sense. Uh, Want to go into a little bit more detail here. Wh which one's the feed in? I'm left. Left. And which was the feed out? All right. 
All right. You haven't seen this transformer yet. I've got a dual feed out here and we'll talk that when we go back out to the field. Uh, how is the secondary fed? What do we call these? Z bars. Z bars. There Z you go. Bars. Okay. So, uh, you know, if you want to add a little detail there and get a little bit more descriptive with it, you've got plenty of room to do that. All right. Secondary enclosure delivers low voltage to customer. Well, that's kind of vague. Somebody give somebody give me some more input there. What? How can I describe what a secondary enclosure does? What's its purpose? It helps distribute power to a home um, from a phase. Right. Um, or to multiple homes. Up Correct. To, uh, Correct. Up to four homes. Or Correct. The, uh, you mentioned a street light or something like that. Right. Right. It, it, it's a junction for secondary. We've got a junction for primary. Now we've got a junction for secondary. What are these things that we're using inside to terminate with? Water tight connectors. Water tight connectors. Which side do we feed on? The left. The left hand side is the inbound conductor. So those are good descriptions to add right there. <coughs> those look like my old shoes, Professor V. I think they are. Okay. All right. And that is the end of the presentation. He's missing one more element. What is that? To the meter. The meter, okay. And it would, would be great if you guys, when you post your meter picture, that you have a feed from underground, not overhead into a meter. That would be very nice. Okay. Any questions as far as the presentation is concerned, as far as equipment is concerned? If I had graded this one, it probably would have been a B. Missing a little bit of detail, and he limited himself on a couple of those descriptions right there. Okay, any questions? All right, Paul. Yes, sir. The Underground Distribution Standards Manual, and everybody, pay close attention here. I've got a, I'm sharing a window, I don't mean to share. Let's go for UDS share. Got it. Okay. So I shared the underground distribution standards manual and you're gonna have coming up here in the process, <clears throat> Professor V and I have got to discuss this. Uh, and to be honest with you, if you wanna use these pictures, you're 100% you're allowed to, you don't have to use the ones on the yard. Uh, knowing what the major pieces of equipment are in the manual and the parts that are included inside. I emphasize parts included inside. The dip pole is not included in here because that's overhead. What was the first item that we came to when we left the dip pole? What was the first item? Switch gear. Okay. And what I'll, I'll do here is I'll help you by giving you the, uh, the drawing number. So this might take a little bit. Well, I might jump all over the place on you because we're coming to the different things. Okay. If you need to know the parts and you will need to know the parts into the future for a secondary enclosure, let's see if I can shrink this down a little bit. There you go. That is an ESG Echo Sierra Golf Dash 4. You'll notice I've got the secondary enclosure and you'll need to know what all parts are included in that. So one is the secondary pe pedestal, two, the secondary conductor that's in it, and three, watertight connectors. You will also need to know the amounts. How many do I have in here? Three, three watertight connectors. So secondary enclosure is an ESG-4. Primary, three-phase primary enclosure is an ESG-21, Echo Sierra Gall-21. What parts do I need inside of it? Of course, I need the enclosure itself. That's number one. 
What's number two? It's in the description. Junction, 200 amp. Don't need to worry about the 600 amp. They've got junction 200 amp. Okay. They list other parts because you can interact with other different parts in here also, as far as the voltage and the amperage is concerned. If you put two junction, uh, junctions in here, how many do you need? One, three. two, three, right? You need, you need three modules in a three phase enclosure. You will be correct. Don't worry about the voltage or the amperage. You're just gonna need three modules. All right, what else is included? Two ground rods, a, a ground rod coupling, a lock, a ground rod clamp, number four copper conductor, and a grounding connector. You're gonna to need to know all those parts. When uh, you see these in the drawings right here, just to give you a heads up, for reference only, Santee Cooper went from metal, and this is what this is, this is a metal three-phase enclosure, and they moved to a fiberglass. They left the metal in the book just in case you come to a, a metal one that's still out there in the field as far as the parts list and what needs to be done with it. And then they included fiberglass so that's for new installations. That, that'll give you a heads up. Same thing with single phase. It used to be metal, sat on a pad. Now they're all one compartment in fiberglass. So you're gonna need the, the junction Excel. How many? One. One, we're working with single phase enclosure. Uh, you, you can use also a portable feed through. Uh, you're gonna need the fiberglass cabinet. That's, the, that's it itself again. Ground rods, ground rod clamp, car, copper connector, and sectional uh, bronze coupling. So that's all included in that one. All right, let's go on to another. What page was that one, the last one? I'm sorry, let me get back to you and I'll give you the drawing number. Thank you for reminding me. That is going to be an ESG-29, Echo Sierra Golf 29. Okay. Now we're coming to Echo Sierra Golf-66. And what is it? Switch gear. Dead front, dead front pad mounted switch gear. How many compartments? Four. Four way. Okay. Now they've got three different drawings down here, and we should know by now the description. You can pick any one of these that you want to: a PME nine, PME eleven, and a PME ten. As long as the one that you pick, you know what the compartments are. This is a four. This one right here that I'm hovering the mouse around. Two by two. How do I know it's two by two? How many feeders? Two feeders, two taps. Two feeders, two taps. The canisters that you see right here designate fuses. These that have blades only are the feeder side. So that designates switches. The PME 11 is, it's a four by what by what? Four by one by three. Switch that around. Three by one. Four, three, one, four compartments, three feeder, dead blade, dead blade, dead blade, one tap fuses. And the PME 10, four by what by what? Four by four by zero. There you go, excellent. Four by four by zero, All right? Uh, just to give you a heads up, we're, we're just working with a four way. That's all we're working in the yard. I, I did tell you before, there are six ways. I mean, you can get configurations and you'll see by these drawings here of whatever you need. But that does good, give you a good idea right here. Six by two by four, six total, two feeder, left and right, four taps. One, two, three, four. All right. Uh, did I give you that drawing number for the four by? Yeah. Yes. Right. ESG-66. OK. 
Okay. Lighting comes at the end of the course. We'll talk about that later. Wow, there's a lot of lights. Sandy Cooper loves their lights. Okay, a PT, Papa Tango-24. Uh, PT stands for Padmount Transformer-24. This is probably, uh, other than the three phase, one of the most elaborate as far as materials are concerned. Padmount Transformer 24 is a single phase Padmount Transformer. Now I'll make this a little bit bigger so you guys can see it. You're gonna to need to know the parts that go into this. Transformer, load brake elbows, how many, how many? Two, insert bushings, fiberglass pad, Z-bar connectors, disposable locks, sealing kits, Secondary cable, primary cable, a crimpet, that's a copper connector, ground rod clamp, number four copper, two sectional ground rods, and one bronze coupling. Again, that is a PT-24. Now they go through some different configurations here. We're gonna use the PT-24 only. Do not concern yourselves with these other drawings of Padmount Transformers. <clears throat> uh, let me see if uh, I want to use this one. PT-64. What are we looking at here? We were at single phase, now we're at? Three phase. Three phase. Mm -hmm. Again, you will need to know the parts and how many. So if we have three phases in, three phases out, how many load break elbows are we gonna need? Six. Six. How many ceiling kits? Six. Primary cable, we're not worried about the amount, you're gonna need it. Six crimpets, six bushing well inserts, that's what goes into the transformer. Secondary connectors as required. Four secondary spade connectors. Now I don't mind, typically the transformers come with it. If you wanna put the spade connectors, that's fine. If you want to use Z-bars like we use inside the pad mount transformers, that's fine. You can use either one in this scenario on the secondary side. Uh, ground rod clamps, number four copper. You, you're seeing a, a trend here that's going on with most of all the transformation equipment, bronze coupling and one lock. All right, Professor V, is there anything else that I'm missing as far as the no, you got it all. Pad mount equipment? No. Okay. <coughs> all right, gentlemen, any questions there? So that is your reference for all the pad mounted equipment. I don't know if you have or know the capability of how to do a print screen. Uh, if you want to look it up, you can look it up. But if you want to use a print screen and use this in your presentation, it is 100% allowed. Okay. So in the future, what you're going to have is we're going to have these drawings out on a test or quiz. You're only going to get this part. You come down, you're going to come down the answer section and you're going to have to list out all the parts and their amounts in the answer. So be prepared for that. These are good to study. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. It's correct. Now, don't get really, you know, hugely over concerned here, especially in the pad mount transformer section. Pad mount transformers, almost all, especially the ones that I've given you, have the same things in them, the same items. It's just a change in amounts. Let me scroll back to the single phase. Way up here. Uh, PT24, correct? Yep. Yep. Yep, here we go. So, and you can follow by the numbers. Three is the low break elbow, two is the insert. Three is the low break elbow, two is the insert. Z-bar connectors, all, all this stuff that's going on in here. I've got one, I've got two. How many inserts do I need? One, two, they go in the transformer. 
all you need to do when you come down to the three phase transformer is count. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's the same part that you use in single mm -hmm. phase. I just have more of them. How many inserts to go in the transformer? One, two, three, four, five, six. Same amount of ground rods and ground rod couplings and number four copper, that remains the same. Now that I've gone from single phase to three phase, how many more secondary connectors do I need? Just one extra. One extra, three in a single phase, two secondaries, one neutral, four in a three phase, three secondaries, one neutral. So it's just a change in amounts. Are we gonna to have to label the diagram in reference to the parts list? No, but you will have to follow the numbers. That's what I mean. So you're gonna you're gonna already have the numbers on there. I'm gonna take I, I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna tell you what I do right now, and you get, just be prepared for it. I am and I've got the pictures already. I'm gonna take a snapshot of this photograph right here, put it in a test question, and below say list the numbers one through 12 and their amounts. Okay. That, that's it. So once you get the two in there, you're gonna put load break elbow six. Once right. you put the three, that's the cold shrink. Three, cold shrink, six, then that's it. Okay. Okay. Cold shrink ceiling kit. I, that's my slang for ceiling kits. Yep. Okay. So guys, be studying on this. We have not set a date for this yet, uh, but in expectations, be ready for it to be coming soon. Okay. All right, let's X that. And my share screen should have stopped. It did. All right. What time are we holding here? Wow. We are burning some time, aren't we? Yep. So, uh, what I'm going to do here is yesterday we spoke about and we talked about high potting and the method we want to keep in our, in our head is one, identify, isolate, and restore. And we did that in a single phase aspect. And we're also going to today going to review it and do that in a three phase aspect. And then let me see, let me re remind ourselves what, what you guys are holding. You can retest on the test that was yesterday. You've got a presentation that is due when? Friday. Friday. So that needs to be worked on and done. And Professor V, had you posted anything else? Not yet, no. Okay. So when those, does, yes, sir? When does the resume have to be uploaded by? Sir? The end of the year. The resume is graded, right? So when does the resume have to get uploaded by? December 12th. Oh, okay. December 12th. And uh, by all means, if you've got one ready and you want to send it up now, text me and let me know and we can review it. So, I mean, that's a, that's a work in progress, but that door closes December 12th. Okay. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll take a, a short break here. It's about 10, 12. We'll go to, uh, I don't like making it that number. We'll go to 10, 26. <laughs> <laughs> not make it 13 minutes and uh, we'll come back and we're going to go over the three phase. Now, uh, next week, our plan is, and with additional work, you're going to have some work in here and uh, is getting back out of the field is you guys in teams of two are going to do the identify, isolate and restore process in the field. So we're going to split up into two teams. Uh, Professor V is going to take a single phase group and I'm going to take the three phase group and we're going to go out there. We're going to hand you a couple sticks. You guys are going to have to communicate yourselves. I will identify the bad span for you. Like I'll say between T1 and T2 is red and white or between pole number, whatever that pole number is. And the first switch gear, your high pot reading was 3.5 and stayed at 3.5. So I'll give you scenarios like that. You come back to me and you tell me, well, I know it's in the first span. You have to go through the process of isolating the cable that is bad and go through the uh, process of uh, restoring power to everybody from the open point. So that is gonna be on, on your, you guys. 
but we will, after the break here, we will go through the process of how this is done in three phase. All right, gentlemen, see you at 1026. Professor, I got a resume I can send you. Can I send it to you?
we'll go ahead we'll go ahead and restart here at 1026 uh, you know something popped in my head on the break right there uh, for you guys that have got on that test that we're going to go ahead and uh, reopen again for a second attempt uh, for you guys that have got a submission in there already I, I did explain this you're going to be average for the two grades and get an overall grade from that average uh, if you've got a high score now and you get a lower score on the next quiz for some reason I don't know an error or whatever you're going to get average down so be careful and for you people that have not done it yet you've got two attempts. So if you go in there and you get your first attempt and we'll say it's a 90 or a 92 or something in the A, A, A category, and you say, ooh, I'm gonna to try to do that a little bit better. And you go in there and you get an 82, you're going downhill. So I just, it's just a word of caution, warning. Both grades are going to be average. So, do that test at your own, I would say own risk, keep an eye on your scores. And uh, we've got it scored automatically. So as soon as it gets completed, you do the uh, first attempt there, it's gonna take a minute to uh, migrate over to grades, but you'll be able to see that grade pretty quickly. Okay. All right, so uh, we're gonna go back here. I took my share screen off and we're gonna talk uh, about three phase here. And I started in my drawing, let me get back to it. So we had, and we'll go with the same amount of transformers. One, two, three, four, five. Now to some of you, I'm, I'm sure this will sound kind of redundant, we're going to follow the same rules that we did in single phase, except now that we're working with three phase, there's a couple more rules to add. So this is uh, pole one. This is pole number two. And we're going to call this T1, T2, T3, T4, T5. Give you guys a little bit of explanation here. I, I know you've seen transformers and the ones we have in the yard. And uh, we're gonna do a school walk around here eventually where you guys are gonna have to map out where, where lines go. On the transformer itself, we used building 300 for an example. <laughs> it's got some uh, information up here at the top that it shows your primary voltage like 12,470 and 7,200. Then over on the side door, it's got 480 and 277. I mean, just throwing information here to show you where it's at. Every single transformer that's out there on an electrical system has a unique number. And I'm just gonna throw this number out there, 62124. So every transformer <clears throat> out there has a unique, what they call company number. Now for tagging purposes and an identification in a subdivision, or we'll say the school, uh, that little mini mall that's beside us, <clears throat> to help better map this, instead of going into that and tag it also, instead of going to every single piece of equipment and saying from 62124 to 31268, and I'm just using those numbers for example. The company, what they will do, uh, Professor B, jump on, on, on this one too, if you guys do the same, they'll put T numbers on them. Okay. Now it's, it's multi purpose here. The T number is one for better identification and tagging, and two is. If this is six, two, one, two, four, and the next transformer is three, one, two, six, eight, what will happen if I need to change this transformer out? Free tag. 
that that's that's you're you're headed the opposite direction there. I won't need to retag any of my conductors. All I'll have to do when I put the new transformer in uh, is put a T2 on it. Now the conductor that's in here going to it and the conductor coming out of it does not need to be retagged, nor does the conductor going into T3. I gave it a number, T1, T2, T3, T4, T5. I gave it a number of T2. When I change the transformer out, it's gonna get a new company number. I don't know what it's gonna be, 75126 is the new one I install. Does that mean now that I've added a unique number of T to it, when I change the transformer out to that number, do I have to go back to T1 and, and retag the cable? No. Do I have to retag the cable that's in T2? No. No. Do I have to go to T3 and retag the cable? No. No. So you see how much it cuts down on the amount of work that you have to do when you do a transformer change out. The other part too is it, it helps a lot out in communications, guys. When you're working in this and you tell a guy, I'm at, I'm at T1, it's gonna show, it shows on our mapping system and it shows the company number also, this number right here. It's gonna help them while he's at uh, the third transformer in there. So it's, it's really gonna pop down to, if I was to go over to the uh, mini mall, this beside us, it's got a loop of transformers in there and they're all numbered T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, right? And it's unique to that location, to that loop. If I drive over to the school and I've got a loop of three phase or single phase transformers, guess what they're numbered? T1, T2, T3. There you go. So don't get confused if you go to one place. Well, this T1 number is the same as the T1 number over there at the college. It's not. Is there like a location number then? I'm at location 1247 on T1 transformer. If you're wanting to give that information, it, for what reason? No, I'm saying since all the transformers are T1, T2, T3, at uh, each location, is there like a location number that differs by where you're at? I don't think I'm understanding your question. So like you got two separate um, like subdivisions? Right. Like side by side, right? And one subdivision is labeled T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, right? And then the other one is labeled the same thing. Would you like have a differentiate kind of like number or something? That the only thing that's going to differentiate it to two between the T1s and the two different subdivision locations is the company number of the transformer. Gotcha. That's that's unique to every transformer that's put out there. Now, as, as far as, and it, I, I've never seen it, it rarely happens, if ever. I've never seen crews have to go into one subdivision side by side and get on a radio because of multiple outage at the same time and say, I'm going to T1. And the other guy goes, well, I'm in, you know, let's say Quail Creek and Burning Ridge. They're side by side, close to it. I'm in Quail Creek, I'm at T1. Well, I'm in Burning Ridge at T1. Uh, that that is almost never going to happen and if you do need to communicate and not get your uh, wires crossed on that there are multiple channels to use so everybody that's working in one spot can move to another channel everybody that's working in one spot can stay on this channel that they're on so you don't get confused as far as your t locations okay makes sense all right i just want to let you guys know that professor v what do you do at duke it's different. Oh, and it used to be back in the day, back in the um, in the 80s, 70s, they used to use the T1, T2, T3 deal. And then we switched over to um, loc IDs, which is the location ID numbers. And every, every transformer, every pole, everything has a unique number that's, you know, assigned to that equipment pole or whatever. So um, it's not a T1, T2, T3. T3 thing anymore. It's just uh, that loc ID number. Loc ID number. And is it unique for every location? Uh, does it stay the same? No, it's just unique to that one piece of equipment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. 
I understood. It has, um, it has, what it does, it has a number and then it has a, a prefix to it. Like, like in our area, it has like in the King Street, it has like one, two, three, four with a BR. Like me in Sumter would be like maybe one, two, three, four BT. And then the, to just differentiate the, um, the area uh, those numbers are in. Okay, I understand what you're saying now. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that just goes to show you guys, you work for different organizations and different companies that have different policies for marking their equipment. I, I will let you know, and I'm sure Professor V and Duke Energy has, has seen this. If you have any questions about as far as what you're working on, uh, I know Santee Cooper does do it in this fashion. Let me start a new one. Yeah. Don't say it. Is, uh, and I'm just going to draw a road and a street, and you come down here and you work and you come to a transformer. All right. And you're not 100% sure. You've got T1 on it, uh, T12, and it's got the company number 62126. That whenever you give a unique number to a piece of equipment, that is unique to a piece of equipment, and call it into a dispatcher. Uh, they can tell you exactly where you're at on a map. They can tell you the address. They'll tell you which phase you're working on. Yeah, you know, they'll tell you if you're working on three phase. They'll tell you the feed direction. They have a lot of information in their mapping system that they're, that they're able to share with you. Now, do understand. They're sharing information from a software system. You have to verify it. But it is a good reference point for you guys to use dispatchers and the mapping system to be able to get this information. Now, in the old days, we had single lines on paper. Wow. Right. That, that was awful. Now that you've moved to a, a mapping system that's uh, on the internet and online or in, in the local network of, of your company, that works very well. We had also moved to what they called mobile mapping. And mobile mapping is you had a laptop in your fleet yeah. and it was actually tied to a GPS. So it would follow you. And if you parked your vehicle beside that piece of equipment, it would automatically tell you on the mapping system, well, it would automatically put you at that location, then automatically tell you a ton of information about what you're working on, where you're at, and all, all that good stuff at that location. So there's plenty of tools out there that you need to use. Yeah. Even with mobile mapping, I, I can't emphasize this enough, that is a tool. It is not proof. So if you need to do switching, if you need to confirm anything, always use your safety gear, always confirm the feeds first before. Don't make an assumption of what you're getting as far as the mobile mapping system or any kind of mapping system to be fact. Mobile mapping, what you did is you rode around all day and you used it. You took it into the shop in the evening, put it up to a charger, and it automatically updated every 24 hours overnight. Okay. So, so have you ever, with the mobile mapping, pulled up to something and just say, there, oh, it's supposed to be a three-phase transformer and it was something else? Nothing that critical. Uh, we have been to where we've come to situations. Let's, let's do, don't do this. Let's don't, don't, well, let me go down here. You can draw my little road, come down here. You come down here and on the mapping system and it goes, you know, it, it follows the line and there's other transformers that are down through here. And what this A designates, it's on A phase and it just follows you on mapping. So if this transformer is connected to that, it should be on A phase and you've done some testing or you needed to confirm something and it's actually on B. Some things, sometimes you'll run into situations like that. Or you come to this transformer and the night before it got changed out. So you're looking at transformer four, five, six, seven, eight, and mobile mapping is telling you one, two, three, four, five. All right, but that's gonna, that's gonna cure itself in 24 hours. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's pretty speedy, but remember, it, it's a reference. And who, <laughs> I don't know about you, Robbie, who, who mapped this to start with? Do you think a lineman did this to start with? Mm. No. Uh, no. Yeah. Linemen are too busy constructing and maintaining lines. An engineer did this. 
and not to say engineers are bad, but sometimes they make errors. And sometimes engineers cannot get all the information they need without alignment. So they sometimes they have to make an assumption. So like I said, be careful. All right, let's get back to what we were discussing earlier. Rob, what time is it? Uh, 1041. Gee whiz. Dip hole. One, <clears throat> two, three, four, five. Out, up, up, fuse right there. So we will, now I'm just gonna draw one line, but this is three phase. And these are, these are all three phase transformers that we have included in here. So we're gonna to come to here, make that red so you guys can see it well. We're gonna to come to here and make an open point for simplicity's sake. T1, T2, T3, four, five, okay. So we're gonna come into here and we're gonna say red and white. Between T1 and T2 with fault indicators. So where's the bad span? Between T1 and T2. Okay, what you'll need to look out for, and this is not marked on every single pole, it is marked on the poles that I have out there in the yard. Do you remember the cross arm and the three switches we have out there? Yeah. What's marked on the cross arm? B. A, B, C. A, B, C. Now, I, I, mean, I don't know how many times I've probably said this. Are you sure that if I have a blown fuse on A, that it's A phase? No. No. It, it is, it's good to follow it. If I want to use A phase as far as the tagging and everything that goes down here, it's good to follow it but I'm not 100% sure it's A phase. So be careful, wear all your safety gear because the other two phases are still hot that are traveling down the line. So we're gonna say A phase, as I have it drawn here, is blown. And we have a fault on A phase between T1 and T2. Now, did, were you guys paying attention as far as fault indicators were concerned? If I have a single phase fault indicator, how many wires do I stall it on? Single phase. One. One. If I have three phase, and I'll draw the A side of the transformer on three phase, how many fault indicators am I gonna use? You put it on all three. Put it on all three. Correct. So you're gonna put it on, I'll put A, B, and C. If A phase fuse is blown here, you should have a red indication of T1 on A phase here. They should correspond. So next part of the procedure, we've done the identify part. You cannot back feed when I'm when you get ready to restore power, you cannot send power from one dip of any phase, one or two phases, and from another dip of any two phases across the open point. Does it, do you understand what I'm saying there? It's either all three phases feed one direction or the other or none. Does that make sense? I guess not, so we'll talk about it. I didn't quite get what you were saying. I either need, on my, on my uh, three phase underground feeds, either direction, this way or this way, I need to either send all three, all three this way or this way, whatever I need to do and what instance I need to do it in, or none at all. I cannot send on my loop feed, let's do it like this. See, see. I cannot have two phases feeding this direction and picking up T1 and T2 and T3 
and then send three phases back this direction and an extra one here to pick up the one that's lost. Does that make sense? Yeah. Gotcha. yeah pretty much, I cannot cross the streams if you guys watch Ghostbusters. Yeah. All right, okay. So the first thing that we need to do, if we have found that A phase is blown on this pole, is we need to open B and C. If you've lost one phase on this pole, B and C must also be opened. There's multi-purposes here. One, uh, the exclusive one is safety for one thing. So you don't have multiple feeds going multiple directions. The other thing is anything that's three phase equipment that's hooked up in T1, T2, or T3 is not single phasing anymore. Single phasing or loss of phase can be damaging to the customer equipment. So that's the first thing we're gonna do. All right, so we have T1. What is the outbound bushing numbers? H1B, H2B, H3B. What do we need to do with those? Um. <laughs> We've determined it's between T1 and T2. When I say, let me get back to a drawing of a transformer. They should all be stood off, shouldn't they? Right. One, two, three. Okay. So this is H1, A, H2, A, H3, A, H1, B, H2, B, H3, B. So inbounds on the left, outbounds on the right. So I'm talking about the outbound conductor T1. What was your comment there, Mr. Cooper? Uh, they all need to be stood off. Stand off. Park them. Stand off. Uh, park. Okay. What do we need to do to T2? Now, which bushings do I need to go to? One A H U. There you go. T two H one A, H two A, H three A. I need to do what? Stand off. Stand off part. Okay. So I'll draw this into the map here. So what you have done here is you've taken and you've put an open point between all three phases out and all three phases in. So we've identified red, white. We've isolated T1 to T2. What's our next step? Restore. Restore, all right. Go ahead and restore for me, please. Go to T3 and uh close in all h h uh h1 h2 and h3 b bushings there you go h1 h2 h3 b closed that's going to send power to where to t2 to t2 all right we've got that restored what do we need to do at pole one close all the things uh, you need to uh, watch out what we're doing here. Replace fuse and close A. Gotcha. Replace fuse. You close. Yeah. A, B, and C. Okay. That's it. I mean, Pretty similar to single phase there, but we've got to watch a couple of rules that are going out there. Uh, it's inherently dangerous and we never did it. Uh, I'm sure if we ask Professor V, he never did it. I'm not going to take and de-energize. That was a lot to erase.
Okay, that'll be close enough. I am not gonna isolate between T1 and T2 A only. No, do not do that. I'm not gonna then close B and C and then send A from here to here to feed this transformer. No. Okay, that, that for one, guys, it, and this is, this is a simplistic drawing. It gets inherently confusing for one. Two is now you're gonna to have to work in a situation to repair a conductor where you've got multiple feeds from multiple directions. It, it's just too, it's dangerous. That's, that's, that's the only way I can put it. So never, ever, if one has failed, the A phase down here at the bottom left, all three must be open. And your back feed from T3, which was your normal open point here, all three must be closed to pick up T2. Any questions? I got one question on the, uh, between T1 and T2, when you have that bad cable, do you just go ahead and pull A, B, and C phase from T1 to T2 or just replace that single phase? Great question. And this is what happened to me. I'm going to let that hang out there. Well, it's on video, so you'll be able to see this. I'm going to start something new here. And this is something that you need to look out for when you look and observe inside the transformer. <clears throat> I'm going to put T1 as a square box looking straight down into the ground. And T2, uh, well, T2, we were T2, T2, T3, or T1, T2? Before. T1, T2. 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 Right. This is where you guys, and especially if you're the trouble person reporting this information, or you're the person that's getting ready to come and repair it to know what you're gonna need to have, this is where you look inside the transformer. <laughs> We've got a primary and a secondary side. I'm going to draw that barricade right here. We're looking straight down the transformer from the sky. I've got one single conduit here and one single conduit here. Say that conduit's going this direction. And I've got one single conduit here and one single conduit here. And we'll say this conduit, this wire is going from here to here. One pipe, three wires. What do I need to do? Pull all three wires. You got to pull all three out. And I have to admit, uh, it wasn't, when I say in my career, it wasn't too long ago, 10 or 15 years ago, we used what they called single pipe. We'd use a six inch conduit and pull all three phases in it. Yeah. Uh, we thought it was the cat's meow. How many different pulls do you have to make? One. Even, even for a long distance, all you have to do is make one pull of all three phases at one time. But you have a failure of one phase inside this conduit, what happens? All three, all three have to come out and you have to scrap all three phases. Once you pulled conductor out of a conduit, you might as well just go ahead and throw it away. Uh, Professor V, have, ever, have you ever reused? No. Phase pulled up? No. Same thing, pull it out and scrap it and pull, pull in. Pull it out, out, scrap it. You're going to have to pull in uh, three brand new phases. Yep. So recently, and I'm sure, I know they did this. They did a cost analysis of this. But they'll do, what they're doing now is, and we'll look down on the same two transformers from the sky. Okay. Now what they'll do is one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. So I've got three separate inbound wires in conduit, three separate outbound, uh, three separate inbound, three separate outbound. You have a failure of a phase in a conduit, what are you gonna be doing now? Pulling one wire versus pulling one, three. Pulling one wire out, one wire in. It's actually a cost savings that you're not scrapping the other two phases compared to adding three conduits instead of one. That's the practice for us, uh, well, for us, for Santee Cooper nowadays that uh, we, we moved over to. How about you at Duke, Robbie? No, sir, they still do the single conduit. Wow, okay. Well, it just tells you organizations have different. That's right. Different methods. 
but you, you, you're the guy on site doing the trouble, troubleshooting, or you're the first guy to get there to let them know what kind of material they need. If this is 100 feet from here to here, and it's in a separate conduit, how much underground primer are you going to need? Oh. Careful. Uh, 100 feet. I get like 120. I'm thinking around the 120, 120, 130 area. Versus I'm walking on the ground, it's 100 feet. How deep am I? This was in math, remember? 30 something inches. Ain't it? Yeah, so I'm three feet on it. Uh, each end, so that's 106. How high in the air when you look inside the transformers? I'm going to draw more from the facial side. About three feet. How high in the air does the wire go? Two, three feet. So there's two or three feet more each side. So we're going to add another six. That's 112. And you want extra. And you want extra because, yeah. So I'd say, yeah, I need 130 feet of wire. You come over here to the one that's in the same conduit, that's 130 times three. That's 390. Yeah, plus all your terminations and all. Yeah, so or, or 400. So that, you know, that's expensive. <laughs> this compared to that, primary runs, underground one on URD 15 kV primary, runs around $2.67 a foot. Question real quick. Yes. If you do have, you know, if you do have the one damaged line um, in that six foot, six inch conduit and you replace all three, are you going to replace all the hardware as well for all three or can you yep. reuse yep. that? Nope. You have to put new terminations on each, each end. Good question. On all of them. Wow. Yep. Yes. That includes all the terminations also. That's another cost. Appreciate you bringing that up, Paul. That's another you process. Can never, you can never reuse those. Just sir, it's like a risk factor in it. You can't reuse those at all. <laughs> well, uh, to be honest with you, to get them off, once they're installed, to get them off, you pretty much got to destroy them. Wow. All right. Cut them off. To, yeah, because they're they're a one-time install. Right. Uh, that that's one purpose behind it, and two is, <coughs> I mean, it, it's just like. I'll go back to another another thing here. It's like a, a Lyman's credo in, in, out there in the world. If I've got the chance where I've got something that's somewhat old, maybe even a couple of years old, and I've got a chance to install something new, they just do it. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, it, you know I've got the opportunity to do it. They, they just do it. I'm, I'm, I'm overly amazed all the time. Every time that I ask for poles on my pole yard, then I go to companies to ask for them. They bring me brand new poles. <laughs> I have been to their to the uh, Santee Cooper yard. I've been to the Ori Electric yard. Guys, they have tons of poles out there that may have been climbed, you know, in the ground for maybe six months, a temporary line or whatever the situation may be. They have, may have been climbed one or two times. Uh, and I, I'll admit, you know, I'm guilty for it too. I don't want them. If I'm going to install something in the field, I want something brand spanking new. How about you, Robbie? Yeah. 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 It's just kind of locked into a right. person's mind. Unless you tell me to, unless I'm instructed to use that pole that was planted, you know, it was in the ground for six months and four people climbed it. I'm, I'm going to get a brand new 50 foot pole and not use that other 50 foot pole that's to me old. It's kind of strange. Okay, so I mean that pretty much wraps it up as far as the three phase and uh, what you guys need to look out for. And uh, uh, Cole, great question out there. That's definitely some things that you need to look out for as far as your wire pulling and your conductor inside of transformers. Look at it, inspect it. Even even if uh, you know you're you're brand new starting and you're standing out there and you, the guy asks you, well, how much wire do we need? And you tell him, well, all three phases are in one conduit. I mean, that's going to lead him in the direction of, uh, and to be honest with you, uh, you know, if I've got one primary in one conduit and I've got a wire reel, reel trailer, how many reels of wire do I need to bring? Say what? If I've got one primary cable and it's in an individual conduit, and I bring a reel trailer, a trailer that hauls a reel of wire around, how many reels do I need? One. One. It's a nice, small, compact trailer. I've got three phases, all in one conduit. What do I need to bring? 
three, a three phase underground primary wire trailer. And I need to ensure that all three reels have enough wire to make the full distance. It, it's just a lot of headache that you've remedied in the two different situations. You, you will run into this in organizations. They become very efficient and they use a lot of common sense <coughs> to get things taken care of. What time are we looking at, Rob? 11.01. 11.01. Is there anything else that you wanted to add, Professor V? No, that covered it perfectly. Okay. Is there any questions from anyone as far as the difference between three phase and single phase identification, isolation, and restoration? Okay. Uh, Cole Kennedy and yeah, yeah, I did. Cole Kennedy and Ben uh, sat around. Uh, well, let's say sat around. Got with us yesterday, and we had a, a pretty good interview session. Uh, we recorded that and we shared that back to them uh, privately. If there's any takers on that today, we will be back at one o'clock. Otherwise, you guys have uh, plenty of work to do. There's no other questions. Professor V, if you're ready to close. I'm ready. Okay. Uh, did you say there was an uh, extra quiz today, like another one on top of the one we had yesterday or no? No. Okay. No. Now, the, the one that you had yesterday is just staying open, and we, we will text you when that second attempt is available. Gotcha. Okay. Hey, Mr. V, can you look over my resume that I put in the Dropbox, please, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. What time will we be doing that interview thing today? The same time I just told you. One. I'm guessing one, yeah. <laughs> uh <-oh. laughs> and that's a, that's a group thing now. So, you know, we get together as a group. Yeah. Okay. One o'clock.